Right. So we're going to start our opening prayer with actually a prayer um, that's said by Esther in, in her book, or part of her prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. O my Lord, you alone are our King. Help me who am alone and have no help but you. For my risk of danger is in my hand. I have heard from my birth and the tribe of my family that you, O Lord, chose Israel out of all the nations and our fathers out of all their ancestors for an everlasting inheritance and do for them whatever you have spoken. Now we sinned before you and you have delivered us into the hands of our enemies because we have worshiped their gods. O Lord, you are righteous, but now they are not satisfied with the bitter state of our bondage, but they have pledged to their idols to abolish the decree you have spoken and to destroy your inheritance, to close the mouths of those who praise you, and to extinguish the glory of your temple and your altar, and to open the mouths of the heathen, to proclaim the virtues of their false gods, and to extol the human king forever. O Lord, do not give your scepter over to those who are not. Do not let them laugh at our fall, but turn their counsel against themselves and make an example of the one who rules against us. Save us by your hand, and help me home alone and have no one but you, O Lord. O God, you have power over all. Hear the voice of us in despair and deliver us from the hand of those acting wickedly and deliver me from my fear. Amen. Amen. As we'll talk about in a little while, that prayer that I just read is not in most of the Bibles that you will find today, unfortunately, um, or at least in this country. <laughs> so welcome back. Um, we're we're going to continue our book-by-book book summary. We spoke last time a little bit first about why the Old Testament in Greek is longer than the Old Testament in to the Hebrew today. Um, what is often in shorthand referred to as the Septuagint, and why essentially there are books in the Orthodox and Catholic Bibles that you don't find in Protestant Bibles and, and modern-day Jewish Bibles. As I pointed out, actually, I was mentioning to Sarah before, when the King James Bible was first published, it had all those books. And for, for many, many years, when they would publish the King James Bible, it still had those books in it. And it's only really in the 1800s that they stopped publishing those books as part of the Bible uh, in most Protestant uh, uh, editions. Um, and, well, I mean, it's, it's sort of a complicated aspect to it uh, of, of why, but part of it is like the Gideons and all them, it was easier to publish without it. You know, it became sort of a, in large part, a cost thing, but there were other more political and theological reasons for it as well. In any event, um, that led us to the first of these books that, that uh, the church has always accepted, but is not accepted today by, by the modern day uh, uh, Jewish canon and Protestants, which is the book of Tobit. One of my favorite books. So if you haven't read that, go back, listen to the talk, and read the book. Um, it's or or don't listen to the talk, but still read the book. Uh, and now we're going to come to the next of these books, uh, which is the book of Judah, a book that's very near and dear to my heart since that's my mom's name and my daughter's birth name, uh, and so I've always uh, appreciated the book of Judah very much. Um, the Finally, be gotten out of batteries on this thing. Okay, well, so be it. Um, so, uh, it's debated whether or not this book was originally written in Greek or Hebrew. The oldest extant Hebrew texts for this book that we have date from the Middle Ages, so very relatively recent. Um, and it's not even clear whether those were from. If those are from some other older Hebrew text, whether it's actually a translation from the Greek into Hebrew, it's not entirely clear. Um, so it's still kind of debated which language it was originally written in. They believe that the book was probably composed in about the second century BC, is when the, um, the various texts, fragments, uh, oral tradition of this book were kind of compiled and edited into one text. Uh, the name Judith means literally Jewish woman or Jewess um, or praised right, from the name Judah. 
Um, yeah, this is a lot more. Um, so it refers, the book says that it takes place in the 12th year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, who reigned in the great city of Nineveh. So this is already a little bit of a problem, okay? Because uh, Nineveh was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar's father 12 years before Nebuchadnezzar ever became king. So Nebuchadnezzar never ruled from Nineveh because Nineveh didn't even exist anymore when he was king. It also describes him as being the Assyrian king, um, and Nebuchadnezzar was Neo-Babylonian, he was not Assyrian. Okay. This leads a, some scholars, the, the going um, theory out there is that this book is just historical fiction and Judith never existed. But that's not the way that the tradition of the church has treated her. We have recognized her, we have icons of her, we commemorate her on the Sunday before Christmas. Um, there are references to her in some of our hymns. We treat her as having been a historical person. And that's okay. And I'll, you know, because the reality is, first of all, <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar was thought by these same types of biblical scholars for many, many generations to have been himself a work of historical fiction. They said there never really was a king of Babylon named Nebuchadnezzar. This is all, all the references to him in, um, in Judith, but also in Daniel and elsewhere. Those are all just historical fiction. He never really existed. Until modern archaeology started digging up all of these archaeological remains showing, oh, actually, he was one of the most important Neo-Babylonian uh, kings. He was a great builder, he was a great soldier and conqueror, and I guess we were all wrong. In fact, he's real, all right? And I think the same thing is going on with Judith, right? The church has always said, yeah, Nebuchadnezzar was real. And these enlightened scholars all said, no, it wasn't, and then they were proven wrong. Nebuchadnezzar was the Neo-Babylonian king from about 605 to 562 BC, but he came to typify all of the enemy kings of Judah in the latter part of its kingdom and after the exile into Babylon. In a lot of the literature, Nebuchadnezzar was sort of the arch enemy, the arch nemesis of Judah. Um, <clears throat> and so it's not surprising that a Jewish writer in the second century BC would have Nebuchadnezzar on his mind. And in the absence of knowing who a bad king is during this period, would write Nebuchadnezzar, okay, as he's editing it all. Um, what we actually see is that a little bit before him, there is a neo Assyrian king named Ashurbanipal, however you say that. Uh, who reigned from 668 to 627 BC. During his reign, there was no king in Judah because Manasseh, who we talked about before, uh, was held captive in Nineveh. And the book of Judith points out that during the time of the events of this book, there was no king in Judah. Okay. It also says that the leadership in, in Israel or in Judah, was being exercised by the high priest whose name was Joachim. Guess who the high priest was during this period when Manasseh is in Nineveh and Ashurbanipal was king? It was the high priest Joachim. And so there's a lot of historical and archaeological sort of keys that suggest that probably what's going on is that this is taking place in this time period, 668 to 627 B.C., under uh, Ashurbanipal, and then when the Jewish editor, several hundred years later, is compiling all of this, it may be that what came down to him didn't have the name of the king. And so he puts in Nebuchadnezzar as sort of the arch nemesis of Judah, um, but in reality, this is, this is happening during this other king. Does so that really make saying this guy is a Nebuchadnezzar as, a, as an idea? It, exactly. In the same way that, I mean, today, right, we sort of, it's not uncommon for us to refer to anybody who has fascist tendencies as like a Hitler, mm -hmm. right? Or, or Napoleon, mm -hmm. right? There are these evil arch bad guys, leaders, that we tend to use their name to describe other people. Mm -hmm. And I think the same process is probably going on here. 
you know, this is still a little bit unsettled in the scholarly world, but this theory to me makes the most sense of how this book can be a historical record and we make sense of some of the historical anachronicities within the, within the book itself. Um, does that make any sense? Um, all right. Um, so the book really is broken into two sections. The first seven chapters is the first section, and it describes Nebuchadnezzar's general, Holofernes. He is appointed to annihilate any people who dare resist his king. Okay? And it goes in some detail talking about the way that he goes into various areas and wipes out anybody who's resisting the king. Okay? Commits genocide. Um, he attempts to attack Judah, but the people take a defensive position in the mountains. That was the, I had that little picture up there before, the, the hills of Judea, also called sometimes the, um, the Hebron Mountains, uh, which get referred in various times in the gospel in Hebron. So they flee to the hills and take up a defensive position, um, and Holofernes lays siege and blocks the water supply so that they can't get water very easily in their in their village. Uh, the people are in dire straits, right? They're really at the end of their ability to survive and to keep going, and they don't know what to do. Um, <clears throat> Holofernes actually asks his main officer to describe who these, these Judeans are, these Judaites. And there's this wonderful description of them. This is chapter 5. He says, But now they are returned to their God, and are come up from the places where they were scattered, and have possessed Jerusalem where their sanctuary is, and are seated in the hill country, for it was desolate. Now therefore, my Lord and Governor, if there be any error against this people, and they sin against their God, let us consider that this shall be their ruin, and let us go up, and we shall overcome them. But if there be no iniquity in their nation, let my Lord now pass by, lest their Lord defend them, and their God be for them, and we become a reproach before all the world. Doesn't that describe exactly the history of Israel and Judah, right? If they're following the law, if there be no iniquity among them, God is going to defend them, and anybody who tries to come at them is going to be wiped out, right? But if they're sinning, if they're not following the law, God's going to allow them to be chastised. So... It's this, and this is out of the words of a, of a pagan, right? This is out of the mouth of a pagan saying, well, let's find out. I mean, if, if, if they're following the law, right, we're in trouble. And if they're sinning, we'll be fine, right? Um, just summarize, like, everything from basically, right, the, the, the foot of Sinai when they're worshiping the golden calf all the way up to the present, right? It just sort of, that's exactly what's going on. So, it then turns to a description of one of the women there named Judah. She's a pious and beautiful widow who lives in the town being besieged. She lives a life of chastity and prayer. And she turns to the people that are there and encourages them and says, let's pray, let's fast, and let's repent. This is coming more or less on the heels of what Lafreniere's officer had just said, right? If they're following God's law, we're in trouble. And Judith, who, why would they listen to her, right? Remember, we've talked about this way back when we started this Bible study. A widow has zero standing, right? A childless widow in this society has zero standing. She's a nobody. And here she comes as a virtual nobody, and she says, let's pray, let's fast, let's repent, and trust in God, right? And she launches the plan for how she's going to save her people, all right? So she puts on her most beautiful clothes and all of her jewelry. She bathes, she gets ready, probably perfume, right? whatever they use for makeup at the time, she does herself up completely, and she's known to be quite beautiful. She's stunning, right? She goes to Holofernes' officers, 
And she says to them, I've got a secret way for Holophanes to get into the village. I've got the trick. I've got the secret way where I can show him how to get in. Right? Just take me to him. And they say, okay. So they take him to Holophanes, and immediately he's just oh, like overcome because here is this amazing, stunning, beautiful woman standing in front of him. Right? So he immediately orders that a tent be set up next to his, right? Put up a tent for her, stay a while, lady, please, just stay a little while, right? Puts her up in the tent and allows her to stay for a few days. She has her, her servant woman with her. On the third day, Holofernes decides to throw a large banquet, right? And he's gonna throw it for her and woo her, right? Seduce her, whatever. And so she hangs around and gets him drunk as a skunk. Okay, she gets him as drunk as possible, and he stumbles into bed and passes out, right? Um, just before that, though, she sends all of his people away, right? She says, hey, he's getting ready for bed. Go away. Well, of course, all the officers think, oh, you know, <laughs> all right. Good on you, Holofernes. We'll get out of your way, right? So they all leave. He passes out in the bed. She goes and grabs his sword, chops his head off right then and there. They had allowed her servant woman to bring in a bag of food. They take the now empty bag, put his head in it, wrap it up. She stays a little while, steps outside, and tells the officers, I need to go out into the desert to pray for a little while. Her law firm is sleeping, right? <laughs> they let her go. She walks right back to her village, hands him Lafreny's head, and they put it on the wall. All right. Immediately then, they take this as a sign that God is on their side. The Holofernes troops are completely beside themselves. They just lost their general to this young widow, and they rout the Assyrian forces and send them packing. Okay. Um, a lot of Renaissance art about Judith and Holofernes. Okay, very common subject. You can find lots of different paintings about them. Um, uh, you know, understandably, right? I mean, this is like, right? Humble, pious widow turns into warrior who's going to defend, beat the general and defend her entire people, right? And, yeah. Excuse me, and this story is in the book of Judith? This is all the book oh, of Judith. Oh, yeah. I'm going to read that yeah. now. It's, it's remarkable, right? Um, and, and what we'll read at the end of our, of our class tonight is her great hymn of praise to God, thanking him for his protection and his salvation. It's a magnificent him of praise. Um, and, but you can see why this is such, a, such an exciting and, and awesome story, right? Um, and Metropolitan Augustinos, who we've been reading, actually points out that what it ultimately shows is the way that Holofernes, this big, brash, egotistical, arrogant general with all of the worldly power, comes in and sees this small little people and says, we're gonna stomp all over them, this is gonna be a breeze, right? And it was the resistance of one humble, righteous person that defeated that arrogance, right? And he points out that we have an example of this in our own times, which we're actually celebrating in just a couple of days, right? This is the incredible bravery of the Greek nation during World War II, when they said, oh, he, no, to Mussolini, when he wanted to use Greece to go through and thought that Greece would just be a pushover country that they'd be able to use as sort of a pass-through for the purposes of, of their designs. Hitler had the same thought, had the same thought about Crete. Hitler thought, we're gonna go in there, Crete's gonna be our great little staging area in the middle of the Mediterranean, we're gonna just roll right through, no problem. He didn't anticipate all of the, the, um, the Cretan people with their guns taking out the paratroopers as they were trying to come down on the island. Um, the small but heroic opposition of the Greek people placed their hope in the protection of the mother of God. Right? Which is why now, originally the Feast of the Protection of the Mother of God was October 1st, and still is in most of the world, but in the Greek-speaking countries, they've moved it now to October 28th, 
It was the very day of all he day, right? The day that Greece said no, no to Mussolini, no to the Axis powers, at incredible sacrifice for the Greek people, right? Persecuted, I mean, I'm sure you and your family think you would be able to tell stories of the way that, that under, under German and Italian occupation, the Greek people suffered immensely. And yet they were brave and they put up the fight, so much so that Winston Churchill could say later that it was because of the Greeks that they won World War II. Right? That it was the bravery of the Greek people that allowed us to win World War II. And that was all due to the protection of the Mother of God. They placed their hope in God, and through the protection of the Mother of God, they were able to succeed. So this actually is the feast that we celebrate in just two days. So it was incredibly well-timed that, that this would come. And it's true, I mean, you talk to anyone who lived in, in Greece during those times, or their parents did, they've heard stories of the incredible, um, uh, you know, the poverty, the, the oppression that the Greek people suffered during World War II because of their bravery standing up for what was right. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, it's why, as much as Winston Churchill said nice things about the Greeks, there's a lot of Greeks who don't like Winston Churchill's name very much, right? Because um, he didn't do much to help him after the fact, right? Um, unfortunately. Um, but we do what's right anyway, right? Even when we're not going to get paid back for it. Um, so that, that spirit that Judith had, and that trust in God is the same spirit that we see within the Greek people, even as recently as World War II. Um, with that, we now turn to the uh, equally fascinating, exciting, and, and I think even fun at times book, Esther. Um, this is not exactly the Veggie Tales version. Um, it is traditionally understood as having been written by Mordecai, who was Esther's uncle, uh, written somewhere around 450 BC. It occurs around the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, but it pertains to the Jews who stayed in what was then Persia under Cyrus, right? Or after Cyrus. Um, so there were groups of Jews who decided not to return to Judea but instead stayed in Persia, in what is now modern-day Iran and Iraq. Um, the, um, oops, uh, what's interesting to note is that the, the Hebrew form of the Book of Esther has no direct references to God. If you pick up the Book of Esther in a typical uh, Jewish or Protestant Bible, there are no direct references to God anywhere in the book. Now you can see the hand of God working through the lives of these pious Jews, but it is a little odd that there are no references to God anywhere in the book, right? But in the Greek text, it has all the prayers and references to God that are kind of in between all of the events, right? Which is sort of the standard biblical model, right? Like we just saw with Judah. You pray, and then you go do something, and then you thank God for that, and then for the next thing that you need to do, you pray and ask God for his help, you go do the thing, and then you thank God for his assistance, right? That's the pattern that you see in the Greek version of Esther, but it doesn't show up in the Hebrew. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating question of kind of why Esther comes down in that Hebrew form, stripped of the, the prayers and the references to God. Um, not that it's not edifying to read, even in the Hebrew version, it is, it's a, and, and it's also, incidentally, one of the easier books and places to read, although it, it not everywhere. Anyway, um, you know, the, the Jews who stayed behind in what had been Babylon and then became Persia, um, in, there are still, even to this day, a very large Persian Jewish community, numbering about 350,000, 
Most of them have now moved back to Israel or to the United States. Um, but you know, even as recently as 100 years ago, there was still a very, very large population of Jews in, in uh, what had been Persian. Is this the Sephardic uh, community? Do you know what that's where they're at? Uh, some. I mean, there. I don't know exactly the breakdown of what you might call Middle Eastern Jews, right? Because there were also there's also a large community in, in for example, Yemen, oh, right. and sort of the Southern Arabian Peninsula. And I don't know exactly the migration history there. Um, um, incidentally, though, if you want to hear Hebrew arguably pronounced closer to the way it probably was, listen to the Yemeni or the Persian Jews, um, because they still pronounce it with a Middle Eastern accent. The modern Hebrew pronunciation you often hear is really more influenced by Russian and German. You know, Yiddish, for example, is really a sort of a German dialect, right? So you see the German and Russian influences, and even English-speaking influences, on a lot of modern Hebrew. If you listen to Yemeni Jews or Persian Jews read the scripture, it's a whole different accent. It's beautiful. Um, <clears throat> um, the tombs of Esther and Mordecai still is there in Iran. It's a major shrine and, and pilgrimage site. A um, little hard for us to maybe get to uh, as Orthodox Christians, but. But nevertheless, it is there, and it is still a pilgrimage site to this day. Um, so it starts with uh, a description of Mordecai. Mordecai is a Jewish man in the service of the Persian king, um, Adazerxes, they, they say in the scripture. It's Xerxes, um, who we know from history, from Thucydides, and from others. Um, Mordecai, the, the book begins with Mordecai having a prophetic dream regarding the plight of his people and what's to unfold. Incidentally, the last part of the book in the Greek is a, um, an interpretation then of that dream, kind of looking backwards through the book of how it played out in the book. Um, Mordecai overhears a plot against the king's life and informs the king. The, the, uh, and, and the king is obviously very glad, but doesn't really do anything to thank him. Mordecai has this, this enemy, this guy who doesn't like him, named Haman, right? And Haman uh, is incredibly envious of the fact that he's getting in good with the king uh, because he's, he's foiled this plot. <coughs> Meanwhile, Artaxerxes, King Xerxes, throws a banquet and at a particular time, his wife, Queen Vashti, is supposed to come out in all of her finery um, as sort of this, almost like a showpiece, right, in the course of the banquet. And she refuses. She says, I'm not coming to your banquet. I'm not doing what she asked. He's furious and immediately divorces her, dethrones her and divorce, divorces her, right? Um, so he decides he's going to have a beauty pageant to find himself a new wife. So as all of the eligible, beautiful women of the, the kingdom come forward, um, and Mordecai's niece, Esther, is extremely beautiful. But Mordecai says, hide your Jewish heritage, because that could be a problem. So don't let them know you're Jewish, just, you know, whatever the beauty pageant meant, go do it, <laughs> right? Um, and sure enough, uh, King Xerxes is, is overtaken, she's beautiful, and he chooses her to be his new queen. Um, meanwhile, uh, Mordecai foils another plot against the king's life. Okay, apparently it was dangerous to be a king in Persia at that time. He foils another plot against the king's life. And the king is very grateful, but doesn't really do anything about it another time. Right? Even less this time. Meanwhile, though, Haman... Um, creates an edict calling for essentially the extermination of all the Jewish people. Wipe them out, right? They're not even going to be second-class citizens anymore. Just wipe them out. You can go attack those who are in Judea. Just be done with it. Right? And he gets the king not paying much attention to sign it. Um, Esther and Mordecai are, of course, um, you know, horrifying. And uh, Mordecai and all of the Jews fast and pray. They begin to pray, they begin to fast. Lord, save us from all of this. Um, 
Esther decides to throw a banquet for the king. Meanwhile, Haman's outside. He's like, I've got this Mordecai now. He's a Jew, and I got my edict. He's literally outside building a gallows on which he's going to make sure that Mordecai and the other Jews hang. Okay, So Esther's in there throwing a banquet for the king while Haman's out building a gallows for Mordecai to die. Okay. Um, what happens is um, the king is tired and having trouble sleeping after this banquet. And Esther begins to read for him, or he has read for him, um, the chronicles of like what he's done as a king, basically, to try and help him fall asleep. <laughs> and in the course of reading these chronicles to him, I mean, think about it, right? I, I don't know whether I'd, I'd fall right asleep if somebody read the story of my life yeah. to me, right? <laughs> or if I'd be so tormented by like, how could I be so stupid that many times I might not ever sleep. I, I don't know what you would be. But in any event, they read him the chronicles. And um, he, he is reminded in the course of that, hey, that Mordecai guy saved my life a couple of times. Mm. So um, he goes to Haman and he says, Haman, what should I do for somebody who I need to honor, who has been a wonderful servant to me, right? And Haman thinks, all right, you know, I'm in, right? He's gonna, he's gonna honor me and everything. He says, well, you should dress him up. Let me think, do we have the, uh, yeah, dress him up in a white robe, put him on a white horse, with a bunch of people around him and trumpets and ride him through the entire city street saying, you know, this is what the king does for people who honor him, right? And, um, and, and the king says, that's a great idea. Um, you know, servants, make it so for Mordecai. And he was sitting there going, what? That guy? <laughs> so he sees. He's so upset. Right? Um, and uh, in that moment, Esther has another banquet for him, and the king, through all of this, sees through Haman's trickery. He sees through what Haman's up to, and eventually orders that Haman be hanged on the gallows that he built for Mordecai. Okay. Um, with that, then, Esther also reveals um, her, at, at Mordecai's encouragement, she reveals that she's Jewish. And she says, explains to him what Haman's edict meant, and has him sign an edict now revoking the original uh, edict, saying, no, actually, the Jews have my protection, they're allowed to worship their God, they're allowed to be there in Judea, none of this, right? And the text of these edicts are actually maintained in the Greek version. So we have the actual text of these, of these edicts. Um, this actually, this, this um, celebration of Esther um, and her intervention, saving the Jewish people from the edict that Haman had gotten, is still celebrated by the Jewish people today as the Feast of Purim. Um, and so, you know, as you can see, it's an incredibly um, fascinating and just, you know, interesting story as well as being so beautiful to see the way that God is protecting his people through all of these twists and turns of, you know, royal intrigue and, and so on. Um, Metropolitan Augustinus, though, points out that ultimately each of us is Esther. Because throughout our lives there are times when we are forced to decide Will we act with boldness for the sake of truth and righteousness and for the sake of Christ? He says, our conscience is Mordecai, telling us now is the decisive moment to stick up for truth and righteousness. This is the moment in which we need to act in a certain way. And at the same time, we also have to recognize that at times we've probably been faced with such situations and failed to act. We didn't heed our conscience, and we didn't act. Um, there's a robust tradition within the church about our conscience, and listening to our conscience. 
Uh, Bishop Alexander Milian, uh, a Russian Orthodox bishop last, in the last century says, he who listens to the voice of his conscience will never regret or be ashamed of his behavior. Right? In Matthew 6, 22, Christ says, if your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Bishop Alexander points out that where it's talking here about your eyes, it's referring to our conscience. Right? If our conscience right, is good, then our whole body will be full of light. But if our conscience is bad, our whole body, meaning our whole self, will be full of darkness. Um, there's a great little line from the Russian poet Pushkin, right? Conscience, a sharp-clawed animal which scrapes the heart. Conscience, an uninvited guest, annoying discourser, a rude creditor, and a witch which dims the moon and graves. <laughs> In other words, when we don't follow our conscience, it doesn't let up, right? It doesn't let up. Um, Similarly, St. John of the Latter says, After God, let us have our conscience as our mentor and rule in all things, so that we may know which way the wind is blowing and set our sails accordingly. Likewise, St. John Chrysostom says, He who lives in evil is punished in hell prematurely, being pierced by the conscience. Right? Um, we have that inner voice have that inner voice that tells us what's right and what's wrong. We know that it's there and how many times in our lives, how many times a day, do we not listen to it? Right? But as that line from the gospel explains, we can have a good conscience and we can have a bad conscience. Right? There are many people whose conscience has been misformed, deadened, quieted over the course of their life. So how do we develop a good conscience? How do we develop an orthodox conscience? Um, this is a list from Hiram Monk Ambrose, who I, if I, it's the correct monk I'm thinking of, it's formerly Father Alexei Young. Um, number one, have a love for God above all things. If we love God, that is the first and most important thing for forming our conscience correctly, because we will love him and want to do what is pleasing to him. Two, Pray often at home and at church. When we pray, our conscience is being formed. Three, study the scriptures. Read the Bible. Allow the scriptures to form our mind and our heart. Four, attend to the services and receive Holy Communion often. The more that we are surrounded in worship and participating in worship, the more that we are receiving Christ himself in us, will be able to hear his voice. Five, read the lives of the saints. Read how they faced temptation in their life. Read how they comported themselves in the course of all sorts of different events and, and things in their life. Six, practice the presence of God in our daily lives. What does that mean? Remind ourselves over and over and over again, God is with me. God is here. He's present now. He sees me. He's with me. He's within me. He's here. And allow that to become a prayer. Even if it's as simple as, hi, God. Right? Thanks for being with me. Right? Um, I love that story, and I, I say it from time to time. Uh, I know Metropolitan Anthony Bloom repeats it of the French priest who would see this old man sitting in church day in and day out. No book, no prayer beads, just sitting there. And he would sit for hours. Finally, the priest comes up to him and he says, you sit here all day and you don't have prayer books, you don't have a Bible, you don't have a uh, you know, prayer rope. What are you doing? And he says, I look at him, he looks at me, and we are happy. Mm -hmm. That's the presence of God in our lives. Examine our conscience often and repent and confess what we find. In the monasteries, we'll even walk around sometimes with a little pad of paper 
And the moment that they realize they've done something that has pricked their conscience, they write it down. They confess it right away. Right? They go see their Yerona, their Yeronisa, and they confess it immediately. Now, this is a more radical form of confession, but, um, uh, but we can do something similar, right? At minimum, every night before we go to bed, we can take a few moments to review the day being passed. Identify, how have I fallen today? Right? How have I sinned today? And then don't wait. Get on your knees and say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for my sins today. Right? And then allow the prayer from the night before to become part of the prayer the next morning. Lord, I've been struggling. I've seen in myself. I struggle in these areas. Give me the strength today. Give me the strength today to struggle against this temptation and this temptation and this temptation. Right? And it may be that that prayer isn't going to, that examination of conscience and that prayer may not change very much. And God may not let you see how your struggle is being victorious for a long time. Um, and that's okay. Right? That's part of being brave and valiant like Judith is we keep fighting, we keep getting up even if it's the same thing, over and over again, right? I'll never forget one time I went to, went to confession and I, I said to the priest, I said, well, Father, confession really isn't any different than last time. And he said, that doesn't surprise me, but I don't remember what you said last time, so you're going to have to say it again. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, it's got it. You have to repent and say it, right? You have to identify what you We can do that every day, or even in the moment. This is, this is one of the things that is really hard for us to do, right? The moment that we sin, the first temptation that comes immediately is shame. The very next temptation is shame, right? I can't believe I've done this. What have I done? Look at you, you wretch, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's the temptation. We shouldn't be surprised when we fall. The surprising thing is when we don't fall, right? Right. That's when we say, oh, thank God, you, you, you did something, Lord. You kept me from myself, right? You stopped me. When we fall, we say, well, yeah, that's what I do. And rather than falling immediately into the shame, which causes us to look inward or to look downward, we immediately fall on our knees and say, Lord, don't wait. Don't wait. Say, Lord, forgive me now. Right? And then you move on. You stand up and you continue. Right? There's a line from the Desert Fathers where they ask, the pilgrim asks the monk, what do you do out here in the desert all day? And he says, we rise and we fall. And then we rise and we fall again. And we rise and we fall until Christ takes us in one or the other state. <laughs> right? This is what we do. We rise and we fall. When your conscience is bugging you, don't ignore it. Right? And I say this because, and as all of the things that I'm describing are the things that I do too, right? Um, we, we do this to ourselves so often, right? We ignore our conscience, we do it anyway. Then we feel ashamed, our conscience says repent, and we say, no, I'm too ashamed to repent. Mm -hmm. right? And we put it off, and we put it off, and we end up actually just falling again and again. Right? Um, don't wait. And at minimum, the night before you go to bed is the time when we can, when we can take that opportunity so that we don't stay in that state perpetually. And if we have that habit, it'll knock us out of it, right? And then finally, we struggle to avoid judging others, right? If we can avoid judging others as best we can. Um, St. Paiso says when we see somebody sinning, when we're tempted to judge someone, what we say is, Lord, through their prayers have mercy on me. Right? Through their prayers have mercy on me. 
Um, there's a story um, my spiritual father has had to tell me often. Um, there's a, um, there was a priest he knew um, who uh, was having some difficulty with one of his parishioners. And his parishioner was complaining to, at the time it was Archbishop Iacobos. Archbishop Iacobos complaining and complaining and complaining. And the Archbishop had heard so much about how terrible this priest was, right? What a terrible job he was doing. The Archbishop says, okay, I'm going there myself. And he flies there and he gets off the plane and um, he, you know, is basically prepared to kick this priest out and send him away, right? Send him packing, maybe even just retire him altogether. Because everything he's heard says, this is just the worst priest in the world. And the Archbishop begins to experience life in the parish over the course of that weekend and sees how actually his parish loves him. His priest is doing great things. The parish is in great shape. And it was just this one person who hated him and was trying to get him fired. And the Archbishop finally says, you know, forget it, Father, God bless you, you're doing great, gets on the plane and leaves. This priest goes to Elder Ephraim, though, and says, you know, this guy is a struggle for me. Right? And the Elder looks at him and he says, your salvation will depend on the degree of love you have for that man. This is how we learn not to judge. <laughs> to love our enemies, right? With that, um, why don't I, why don't I read, um, I want to read the Song of Judith, this is chapter 16, to end tonight. And Judith said, begin a hymn to my God with tambourines, sing to the Lord with cymbals, lift to him a new song, exalt him and call upon his name. For God is the Lord who makes wars cease. For into his camps, into the midst of his people, he rescued me from the hands of those pursuing me. The Assyrian descended from the mountains of the north. He came with the countless numbers of his army, whose multitude blocked up the rivers, and his cavalry covered the hills. He said he would set my territory on fire and slaughter my young men with the sword and dash my nursing babies on the ground and take my children as plunder and my virgins as spoil of war. But the Lord Almighty has thwarted them by the hand of a woman. For their mighty man did not fall by our young men, nor did the Titans' sons strike him down, nor did tall giants attack him. But Judith, daughter of Merari, and the beauty of her appearance disabled him. For she took off the garment of her widowhood to exalt those afflicted in Israel, and anointed her face with perfume and bound her hair with a headband, and put on a linen garment to entice him. Her sandals caught his eyes, her beauty captured his mind, and the sword slashed his neck. The Persians shuddered at her courage, and the Medes were disturbed at her daring. Then my downhearted people raised the war cry, and my weak ones cried out, and the enemies were terrified. They raised up their voices, and the enemy was overthrown. The sons and the handmaidens stabbed them, and wounded them as the offspring of fugitives. They were destroyed by the army of the Lord. I will sing a new song to my God, Great are you, O Lord, and glorious, marvelous in power and unsurpassable. Let all your creation serve you, for you spoke and they were created. You sent your spirit and he formed them. There is nothing which can resist your voice, for the mountains with the waters shall be shaken at their foundations. At your presence the rocks shall be melted as beeswax, and yet you are merciful to those who fear you. For every sacrifice is a sweet-smelling offering is like nothing, and the fat and the whole burnt offerings is like nothing to you. But he who fears the Lord is great in all things. Woe to the nations that rise up against my people. The Lord Almighty will punish them on the day of judgment. He will give them over to fire and worms in their flesh. In pain they shall weep forever. It says, when they came to Jerusalem, they worshipped God. And then when they were purified, they offered their burnt offerings, free will offerings, and their gifts. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.